Well, welcome everyone and uh, thank you Giuseppe for the invitation uh, to, to speak today um, about our experience of uh, using EGI services uh, over a long period of more than 10 years now. So just to put a little bit the, uh, the stage and the background, uh, so we NMR and uh, <clears throat> our community uh, is uh, in the field of life sciences, domain of life sciences, and in particular structural biology and computational aspects thereof. So we are studying uh, using a variety of techniques, molecule of lives. Uh, so we have a huge amount of uh, genomic information these days, which encodes for the proteins, and the proteins are really the workhorses of life. They are the one doing uh, all kinds of, of functions, reactions, transmitting signals, receiving signals. They are also the one responsible for the current, current COVID uh, pandemic. So getting access to structural aspects of those uh, proteins, those molecules of life, is very important to understand disease, uh, to make new molecules, to engineer, improve current molecules, make materials, uh, and as a starting point for drug design, which is well, always relevant. And these days, there's also especially a lot of efforts targeted toward uh, fighting the current pandemic. So this was about the background. And just to give you already uh, just a preview, uh, in my group in Utrecht, we are developing a number of software. And the most uh, probably known and uh, used one is Haddock, which is an integrative modeling platform for the modeling of interactions between biomolecules, which can incorporate a lot of different information from bioinformatics or experimental uh, measurements to, to guide the modeling process. And Haddock has been running now on the HTC high throughput compute resource of EGI for uh, more than 10 years. It has a large user community and it has generated a large number of uh, uh, usage of uh, say CPU usage on the HTC resources. Currently about 50% of all the jobs that have been generated have been running on uh, on the EGI and EOSC uh, HTC resources and mainly in grid computing in this case. So uh, how is this all made possible? Well, through the years uh, we have been supported and uh, meaning that we're also partners in a number of, uh, well, FP7 first and then Horizon 2020 projects. Uh, and this is how we got into touch with this kind of services and uh, computing. So how does that, uh, say, historical perspective looks like? Uh, we started in 2007, actually, uh, with ENMR. You see here, we NMR, but before adding the W, which stands for worldwide, we started with ENMR. And this was our first contact with uh, high throughput computing, grid computing, and the chaperone in all the work that we have been doing there were INFN uh, in Italy, uh, which introduced us to the, the world of grid computing, and in particular, Marco Verlato, who I've seen is in the audience, who guided us through uh, the jungle that grid computing was uh, at the time for uh, uninitiated people. So WNMR uh, followed ENMR and then evolved into the Westlife project, another uh, European project. We were connected to uh, partners in EGI Engage, former uh, European project where we were operating as a competence center. We were involved in Indigo Data Cloud European project. Uh, and you're going to see some of the component of that project coming back later in my presentation. And now we are currently uh, also a partner uh, operating in the European Open Science Cloud Hub project. And in terms of uh, the larger perspective, all the services and activities that we are carrying on as we are are also associated with the Instruct uh, S3 project, Instruct ERIC. So now a few words about uh, our virtual research community, we NMR. So we have a, a website, which is the entry point for the community, www.wenmr.eu where you find uh, information about uh, WNMR uh, and what are our, our goals or aims, you know, where you find uh, links to the services, uh, where you find support activities and also tutorials. So our aim from the start with WNMR, so more than 10 years ago, was to bring uh, 
complementary research teams, both ex experimental teams and uh, in the life science area together into a virtual research community and make use of the uh, computational and uh, say data sharing tools that uh, EGI throughout the years and throughout projects uh, have been uh, uh, providing to streamline all the analysis and modeling which is required to transform the experimental data into 3D model of those uh, proteins and uh, complexes that I've been showing you in my uh, first slides. So just to give you an idea of uh, the community or the impact of, of the community, so this is a, a world map of uh, where our users are. So as I already said, we were supported over the years by many European projects, but since pretty much the beginning of our activities, the community has been very much worldwide. Uh, you see here, so these are statistics from a few days ago. Uh, so we had over 17,000 in total users that registered to uh, some of the WNMR services. Uh, so this is only the statistics from the portals that are operated in, uh, in Utrecht. You see that by far, Haddock is the most used uh, uh, service with more than 16,500 uh, users uh, from more than 110 countries uh, uh, worldwide. The largest community comes uh, basically from, from India, as you see from the color coding, then Europe aggregated about the same size and US. Um, so this is actually uh, constantly updated and uh, accessible online from the URL that you see on the left side. So it doesn't mean that we have 16,000 users uh, every day using our services. So per year, we estimate uh, what we actually, we can actually calculate that we have uh, per year, uh, maybe in the order of uh, three, 4,000 users active. Uh, users are usually active for some per period of time, which can be months, and some are never coming back because their project was done and they moved to some other field of uh, research or work, and some are coming back after one year, two years, three years. So we have some users that have been consistently using our services over a long period of time. And what we also observe uh, now is that the services are also embedded into teaching, into education, because we see every year at given time of the year, registration from students from different universities around the globe uh, that are registering for uh, student projects. So they have assignments where they have to use the services. And that's, I think, a very nice development from our side, because it means that uh, students already are learning to use our services and learning and getting used to using the infrastructure provided by the EGI service. So you see now appearing on the right a graph that, has, that shows you the, the growth of our community since, uh, since, since we started operating the services. We've had our being the oldest uh, one in these uh, statistics. This is a logarithmic scale on the left side. Um, so we have, uh, it looks like the, the rate is, uh, is slowing down if you see that it's curve, curve, but of course, if you know how logarithmic scale works, it means that uh, so a linear curve here still means that we are an exponential increase. And you might notice here that there they seems to be an increase and this is already a COVID uh, related effect, but I will come back to that uh, later. So if you look at now uh, how much compute of how much uh, jobs have been running uh, on the EGI distributed infrastructure. And I must say here that the infrastructure itself is coming from uh, the national grid initiatives from different countries. So EGI itself is not owning the infrastructure, it's federating the infrastructure. Um, but I'm going to come back again to that later. But you see that over the years first, uh, what you see here is that uh, the usage uh, has been increasing. So this is the number of jobs that have been running on HTC resources uh, per month. So you see an increased usage over the year. Uh, you can also see uh, at the beginning where we started to, to develop the tool, started using the, uh, the grid resources. It was not so much user. So this first phase was supported by ENMR, which continued into ENMR. And then we started, uh, we see a scaling up of, of, of the usage. We had here a gap. So there was no special funding uh, to support our activities here, uh, but we kept operating the services. And that means that uh, that's a very important aspect. So you should not stop what you're doing when the funding uh, 
is uh, less, but you still, uh, it's important to keep operating those services, even if you have limited resources, because this may for a reliable resource for the end users that will come back. And uh, after this gap here, we, we kept going with a number of other projects and currently we are operating under the EOS Hub project. So these are the number of jobs run per month. So you see that we have peaks that are related to specific projects where here we are reaching about 650,000 uh, grid jobs running on the HTC resource in a month's time. So this, uh, if we do some statistics over last year, just to give you an idea. Uh, so last year, uh, we consumed the equivalent of uh, 3,200 normalized CPU years over that period. So we could not provide this kind of uh, services to our user community without having access to these HTC resources. And in 2020, over the first three months, this was already uh, uh, 1,200, uh, CPU years, so that's we're expecting to go above this, uh, this number. And this is again reflecting a bit the increased usage of our portals due, among other, by uh, the current pandemic. So uh, what does it take to be able to offer those kind of services? And uh, what are some of the say, solutions that we have been uh, applying and using over the years? So first of all, if you want to offer services, you need to have users. Uh, so building nice services without users is a completely useless exercise. Um, and if you want to attract your users, you need to offer them top of the line design solutions for their research, uh, which means also that the software must be uh, top of the line. Otherwise there is no reason they will come to you. Uh, there are plenty of services around there, so it's important to offer the best that you can uh, to attract your users. Uh, this is an overview of uh, the portals that we have been uh, operating uh, over the last 10 years. Uh, so first of all, you see that they have a kind of a unified look and feel. Uh, some of them you can see, at the, like you can see here an ENMR logo, some of them have WeNMR. And uh, if you were to look at them now, you will find uh, EOS Cub. But in principle, they are recognizable. So branding of the services here is, uh, is important. If we, look at, uh, and, uh, if we look at what is currently running, so currently we are operating under the umbrella of the European Open Science Cloud Hub project. And our portals are also uh, advertised in the marketplace of the European Open Science Cloud. So you can find here, yeah, if you go to this uh, website, you can search for WeNMR or search for a specific service to access it. And this is the, the suite of services which is advertised on the EOS Cloud project. And these are basically the services that are operating now. So over the years, some services were discontinued uh, because uh, sometimes all the software gets becomes obsolete or it's not used much and then keep su keeping supporting that service my mind ask for too much uh, effort from our side which is not worth it if it's not used anymore so of course there are also new services that are being added so the, so the service landscape itself it's a dynamic uh, thing so next to uh, uh, say attracting users by offering them uh, uh, good software, you also need to invest uh, in training them uh, to make the best use of the software. Uh, you need to provide tutorials and you need to provide support as well. And that's, these are important components basically. So on the different, uh, uh, there are different sites that are offering tutorials. Some of them advertise again through, through EGI or the EOS Hub project. Some of them are linked from our WeNMR uh, tutorial page where you find and these tutorials basically describe you how to make use uh, specifically of the portals. Uh, so this is a guide for users to, to make best use of the portal. Uh, we have a support center, um, so we have a YouTube channel as well. So we have been giving many workshops over the years, over the last 10 years. Some of these have been recorded both in terms of lectures about the software, but also uh, training sessions. And they are available uh, in a YouTube channel for people to, uh, to consult and, uh, and look at. 
An example of a more recent uh, workshop was a collaboration in the context of the BioXL Center of Excellence project in collaboration with PRACE. So now we're speaking HPC and HTC, high performance and high throughput compute, which took place last October in, uh, in Finland. In terms of uh, support center, we are also operating in the context of BioXL form where users can uh, ask post questions. They can also contribute to answering the questions. So there are different uh, channels in that support center, in that forum to, to, uh, for the different software, uh, not all software, but uh, quite a number of software that are offered by, uh, by WNMR. And you see from the statistic that you might see here, and this is probably small on your side, but some of the topics are being uh, uh, viewed a lot, uh, like uh, you see here is protein small molecule docking, re relevant for drug design, for example, where there are more than 4,000 views. So these kind of, of tools and mechanisms are important. You need to, to guide your users, you need to answer their questions, and this of course takes time and effort. So you need a dedicated, dedicated team of people who are willing to, to invest in that if you want to, to survive as a virtual research community for over 10 years. So next to uh, say the software, next to providing the support, you also need to make, if possible, the life of the end users easier so that they come back to you. And one of the thing that we did uh, for that in the context uh, of uh, a previous project, of actually in the context also of the current project, the OSCAB was to uh, integrate the EGI check-in, which offer a single sign-on. So people have to register in our portals to make use of the portals. Um, they can do that uh, by creating an own, say, username and password combination. Or they can use this uh, single sign-on mechanism through EGI, which connects which connect to different uh, services. So you might find connection directly to your uh, uh, university. So you might use your university credentials directly to, uh, to connect to the service. Uh, you see Elixir showing up here. You see Aria, which is used by the Instruct uh, Eric S3 project, but you also see social accounts there. So that's a way of basically uh, facilitating the use of our portals by, by our end users. Uh, next, we should also uh, monitor user satisfaction. So this is uh, one of the things that well, you should know if people are satisfied by the services and you should have mechanism in place as well to, to collect input from users so that you can improve your services. So all our portals now have this uh, satisfaction ratings where, uh, that are presented to the user on the result page when they get the results and they can give us feedback. Uh, and this is also nice to have just to report to the, uh, the, the funders to, uh, to show them that we are actually doing a good job. So here the Higher score is five by clicking on the darker screen uh, smiley. Um, so you see that we are doing well uh, for all the services uh, that are listed here. And you can also see which services are most often uh, actually used as well from the number of respondents. So we cannot force people to answer, but uh, this, uh, these statistics are also available online and constantly updated on our statistic page. So, the first aspect was to have usage and thus users of the services, but in order to be able to, to provide services to end user, you need of course access to infrastructure, and in this case, computational infrastructure, e-infrastructure. So as I already told you, we've been in production since about 10 years now under a different project. Uh, so we got access to different resources. We started under ENMR, by building our own infrastructure between the, the partner labs that were involved and then got integrated into the EGI infrastructure. And nowadays we, we get a lot of support for the National Grid Initiative. Um, so the access to the resource uh, has been formalized uh, through the, uh, uh, with the help of EGI for service level agreement and the current, which has been renewed now a number of times and the current agreements uh, runs until the end of this year and hopefully will be renewed. So here we have a number of sites that are committing resources. So up to 60 million CPU hours, uh, some CPU cores. So you see that by far we still have most of uh, our resources in terms of uh, say grid computing. 
and storage. We don't use or need a lot of storage in the kind of work that we are doing because it's not like we are using common data sets that all the users are accessing, but each user submitting to our services brings his or her own data and the data remain the, uh, so the ownership of the data remains by the user. So in that respect, we don't uh, store uh, a large amount of data. So, uh, so there, there are documents the, that are documenting this uh, service level agreement where you can also see here a, a list of sites that have committed to supporting us. Uh, so you find uh, in the Czech Republic, INFN was mentioned. So again, as the chaperone of all these WeNMR initiatives since 10 years. Uh, we have Portugal, we have uh, NICEF and uh, SurfSA in the Netherlands that are also providing us a lot of support. And you see here also Taiwan showing up. And this has been uh, renewed. So if you look now on paper, uh, on paper meaning the EGI uh, accounting and statistics sites, uh, currently we have access to uh, about more than half a million logical CPU cores from 22 sites that are supporting our virtual organization. So VNMR is running on a grid using the enmr.eu virtual organization. It doesn't mean that we could access half a million CPUs uh, today if we needed them. Uh, because a compute model is more an opportunistic model. So we are uh, dispatching job to the grid and we, we catch the resources that are free at that time. So these are not reserved resources, but this is working very well because also the type of jobs that we are sending out, which are relatively small jobs that do not consume a lot of CPU. And it means that they are very welcome in some sites to fill the gaps in, in large, uh, say, cluster and infrastructure that uh, the, the center have. So this is a distribution of where uh, the sites that are supporting us are, are currently uh, located. So you see on the uh, left side the worldwide view. So most of the sites are in Europe, uh, which is not surprising because of the history of all the European project, but you see here uh, Beijing. So this is the Institute of High Energy Physics in Beijing. And pretty much since the start of our activities, they have been supporting us. Uh, this is uh, Taiwan also supporting us. They were project connecting Europe to uh, Latin America. And as a result of that, we have sites in Brazil supporting us. And uh, what doesn't show in the accounting portal of EGI yet are the, the resources that are being provided by the US Open Science Grid, but this is um, only recent in the last uh, couple of weeks as a result also of COVID uh, activities. Now, if you focus more on Europe, you see that uh, we have uh, sites that are supporting us uh, everywhere uh, in, in most countries, quite a few of them actually uh, through Italy, and this is the INFN contribution that you see here and some of these are recent additions like uh, this is the uh, high energy physics sites in Marseille uh, which started supporting us uh, specifically for COVID related projects. So uh, we have users we have access to the infrastructure and then you need to operate uh, so you need to develop software if you are into uh, if you are developing your own software tools and you need to operate and maintain a complex infrastructure which is behind the portals that the user are accessing. And that's not so simple. So I'm uh, giving you here a, a view of what's happening behind some of these portals. So these are the, the all portals are basically web portals, meaning the, the user interact with a web page, uploading data, changing some parameters. Uh, but what's happening behind the portal is predefined. So these are complex workflows. Uh, so, so what needs, what are the steps that are required to oper operate this kind of uh, infrastructure? So we need uh, to, uh, so we have a user registration uh, where we have uh, so a user database which contains information about access rights and maybe access level to the different portal. And this of course has to all be uh, GDPR compliant, so satisfy all the privacy rules of, of the EU. Uh, what you also need to do uh, is to do a lot of validation on what the users are uploading to the portal because you might be surprised the kind of data that people are uploading. Uh, they might not be expert in the field and, uh, and uploading file types of type of data that you will never think of. And you don't want this kind of uh, mistakes in terms of data types or choice of parameters 
to break down the machinery which is done stream from the entry page. So you need to do a lot of validation to ensure that the entire machinery before behind the portal works smoothly. Otherwise, it could be that a few submissions basically are crashing your machinery and then nothing happens more. And you cannot babysit all those portals constantly. You want to be able also to go you know, on vacation or some nice meeting somewhere and uh, don't have to worry about are things still running or not. Well, actually, you always have to worry a little bit about uh, if things are running or not, if you want to provide good quality services. So once this validation and, and user credential have been uh, done uh, checking then you need you might need to pre-process uh, some data so not everything that we are doing is running on the EGI uh, distributed resources so you need also an infra a local infrastructure to handle these kind of services and then we basically have the, the choice of submitting to local nodes so we are operating and uh, Florence the other site in WNMR is also operating local clusters so we have our own infrastructure or you direct the jobs to these high throughput resources provided by EGI accessing grid, uh, possibly sites providing GPU resources if your code can handle GPUs and also cloud resources. Uh, for us, it's important to have both options because sometimes there are issues on the grid side and this should not affect the end users. So we want to be able to redirect the jobs from one side to the other so that we have a continuous operation of the service irrespective of where the jobs are running. So we need a local infrastructure as well. Now, once the jobs are, are coming back from the compute, you have typically uh, all kind of uh, post-processing that needs to be done. So this particular example is about uh, this VIS portal. Uh, and once the, the, say the computation are done, the post-processing are done, you need to present the results to the end user, uh, package the data so that uh, he or she can download the data and generate web pages where they can inspect uh, online the results. So a bit more details about what's happening uh, under the hood. So this is kind of the simple uh, view of uh, what I just showed you. So the user interact with a web interface uh, where we have uh, uh, validation of data credentials and then the, the machinery behind the hood is going to submit jobs to the grid. We are using here uh, the Dirac for EGI service uh, from EGI to do that which is very efficient. I'm going to show you a little bit more uh, and the execution then takes place on the grid. So basically the way that we have been implementing that uh, on our side is that um, so we have uh, for, for for the part submitting the jobs to the grid, we have what we call a job pool. And since we are operating different portals, uh, we have one common pool of jobs. So the different portals are going to drop jobs, which are compute tasks in this pool. And we have demons running on a server, which is, and those demons are monitoring, is there work to be done? If there is work to be done, the demon is going to submit to the grid, Actually submit to Dirac for AGI in most cases and Dirac for AGI does all the magic to submit to the grid or the cloud and we have demons that are basically monitoring those jobs and checking how the jobs finished or was there maybe a problem an error in which case we will submit and if the jobs successfully complete the demon is going to put back the data that have been generated in the right location which is associated with a specific service or portal so in this way, we disconnect the part which is dealing with the uh, interface to the grid, to the cloud, from the explicit services that are running on top of that. And this is the model that we have been pretty much uh, operating for more than, uh, than 10 years now. So I mentioned uh, Dirac for EGI. In the early days of um, uh, ENMR, WNMR, we were using uh, and the GLite software to directly submit jobs to the, to the grid. And this means that you had to install a lot of middleware, maintain, update the middleware. So there was a lot of system administration involved in that process uh, for which you needed to be root, uh, to have root access. And this was quite a say, cumbersome process. And then since 2015, we have been uh, switching to the Dirac services, Dirac for EGI. And this was very much thanks to the help of uh, Andre and Ricardo, whom you see on the, on the right sides. So they basically spend half a day 
in Utrecht helping us to make the transition. And uh, from that day on, we have been using heavily uh, the DRX services for this. It has many advantages compared to the old ways of doing things. So you can install the software without requiring root access, which is uh, useful if you might not have all control on the resources that you, are going, that you are operating. In our case, we have full control, and so that's not a limitation, but it's still very useful. Uh, it has pretty much no other dependencies, so you, you can uh, really interact, uh, install it on its own. And you can even uh, install it on your laptop. So actually, I, I have Dirac installed on the laptop from which I'm giving this presentation. So if I, I can transform my laptop into an HTC server uh, using Dirac in a rather simple way. Of course, you have to learn to use the, the, the methodology, but it's, uh, it, it's quite uh, nice. Uh, so this is already a bit more of, uh, say, details, but this is the job syntax. So this is what you will be giving to, to DRAC when you submit. So you give it a name, you put some requirements on the CPU time that you need, you click a script, and that's the script that's going to be executed on the, on the resources, telling something about output and error files, and then you give it input data. In our case, this is a... The input is the executable, which is a script, plus the data associated with it. And you also tell it what is it that you need to get back. And then DIRAC does the magic, uh, deals with uh, looking which sites are currently available, where to submit those jobs, uh, recovering the data. And then from your side, you just need to monitor if those jobs are completed successfully or not. And then you can recover the result files. So it's very efficient. Uh, you get a high job throughput. Of course, you are transferring data over the network, so it takes a bit of time. Uh, so in our case, we are not transferring a huge amount of, of data, but uh, uh, we submit probably uh, every second a job uh, to, uh, to DRAC. So some statistics. So this is again looking at uh, 2019 as a year. So on the left side, you see a plot as function of, uh, of the months of the year. And you see the number of jobs that were running uh, on DRAC uh, at different sites. And the color coding shows you which sites you find our, our partners in a project uh, from Florence here that have been supporting us, UK sites, but you also find all kinds of other sites. So this is the Institute of High Energy Physics. Uh, and you see here the distribution in the pie plot of where the jobs have been running. Uh, and this is actually the number of jobs that have run on these different uh, resources. The jobs that are running on a grid might be different from what, the from, from what the software is generating in terms of jobs. So we are packaging many jobs into one submission to DRAC uh, so that the, the compute on the grid uh, lasts for a bit longer than just uh, say a few minutes or to make a, an efficient use. There is, of course, some overhead when you transfer and recover the data. So you don't want to send jobs to the grid that will take a very short time. It will be a waste of, uh, of time. So how can we further improve the operation of our services? Because you have to, uh, to run this complex infrastructure. So we have been uh, working on uh, automating the deployment of our services. We use for that now the, the most recent version of our portals are using Docker containers, actually free containers that are providing the, say, the front end, the authentication, the user data. And this is uh, facilitating our life to, to deploy or redeploy the portal. In principle, we only operate one front end of the portal, but we are also development versions. And uh, we also, at some point, we're operating a portal uh, on the cloud using uh, the, fed, the EGI federated cloud as part of a Helix Nebula pilot, and we are currently also deploying such a, a clone of our portal to support some COVID-related uh, projects. Over the years, we have also been making use not only of, say, grid and cloud, but we also could uh, access uh, GP, GPU resources on the grid. Uh, so this is uh, two of the portals that are using uh, GPU resources. I should also mention the Ember portal operating in Florence here. So these are software that can make uh, good use of GPU resources. And uh, for running uh, and accessing the GPUs uh, on the remote uh, infrastructure, uh, we use the uDocker uh, solution. We actually built Docker containers that contains all the software dependencies that you need 
in order to run this uh, GPU enable applications. So that's simple. So then the site administrator don't need to install any software. So that makes our life easier and that makes the life of administ a site administrator also easier. And in order to run Docker without uh, say getting root access to the system, there was a solution developed under the Indigo Data Cloud project called UDocker, uh, which doesn't, give, doesn't require root access and doesn't have some of the security issues that Docker might have. And this was a mechanism basically to, uh, to run GPU enabled software on a grid. So to summarize a little bit the, what I consider the success factors to operate such an infrastructure over 10 years. Uh, so first of all, you need to have something to sell to end users. So you need software which is top of the line uh, and good science to also demonstrate that uh, you know, so your software is delivering results that make sense and that can uh, say, put forward uh, say new, the, the, the science. So that's the, the first requirement. Uh, it doesn't make sense to start spending a lot of time developing services for software which is useless to, to people. I think that's an important point. Uh, manware. We don't speak often about people, and it, so far it was, I mentioned a few names in my presentation. But in order to, to develop all of these uh, services, in order to keep operating those services over a long period, it means that people need to be there as well. So you need to have good people, uh, which is not always simple to find. You need to be able to keep them, uh, and you need to be able to motivate them. They should be willing to, to spend also part of their time in supporting users. You know, some people you might want to do research, but uh, user support, communication, outreach, training are important aspects. So, so the human factor is important. You cannot leave those services running by their own. Uh, so you need people behind the services, and that's extremely important. Hardware, of course, uh, you need CPUs to be able to run the services, to be able to do all these computations. So, uh, in this context, getting access to these EGI high throughput resources uh, has been key. Um, but you also need your own resources to operate the services because you cannot rely ex exclusively, exclusively um, on this HTC resource. They will be always part of this complex workflow machinery that we are operating that require local resources. Networking. I'm not so much here referring to the, uh, say, the physical network to transfer the data. Of course, you need that as well, because if you have a lot of usage, it means that you have to have a good connection to, the, uh, to your local network. Uh, but you also need the networking aspects um, to talk to people, to go to meeting, to go to some of this EU infrastructure meeting, uh, because uh, you need to convince uh, some countries to provide support for your compute, so you need to, to, to build the network of computers, and in order to build this network of computers to which you have access, you also need to build a network of, uh, say, human people. Uh, support, if you want to operate services, you need to invest in support and be willing to support your users. This takes time, but this is an important investment. And of course, uh, well, you need money to do all of that. Uh, so grants over the years uh, have been important in operating all of that. So now to finish with a few um, last slide about uh, say some of the recent development in the last weeks uh, in response to uh, the COVID pandemic. So we have seen from our side, so from, uh, from the Haddock side, we've seen, uh, if you look at, uh, so this is a zoom into the registration of uh, in our portals. So this is uh, mid-January, so we are still in this linear regime, but this is a logarithmic plot, so it means it's still kind of an exponential regime, but you see here all of a sudden that uh, we're getting a steeper increase. So we see an increased number of registration. Uh, and this is uh, for Haddock in, in particular because Haddock can be used to model interactions between viral proteins and human proteins so, or to try to, to do drug screening against some of the viral proteins. Uh, so to answer that uh, demand, we've also been working on our side to uh, increase our capacity uh, to process user jobs. So we could double the number of, uh, of jobs that we can handle per day uh, in the last weeks. We also added options to the portal so that users can tag their submission as COVID-related. You see a snapshot of the submission machinery. Uh, 
So this allows us to, to get statistics first of what are people doing, but also it gives us uh, a way of directing the jobs of those users to sites that are specially supporting us for COVID related activities. Uh, so in the last uh, couple of weeks, there have been contacts between EGI and the US Open Science Grid. Uh, and uh, thanks to these contacts, and uh, actually I must say that we have been uh, running jobs on the Open Science Grid in the past, but this was for now a number of years not working anymore. And uh, actually Marco Verlato, who is part of WNMR, also reopens the, the discussion with the US Open Science Grid and EGI were also uh, talking to them. And as a result, we have now since a couple, since two weeks probably, access through direct to the US resources. So on our side, we didn't, do to, we didn't need to do much except for tagging the jobs as being COVID related. And uh, Andre, whom I mentioned before, basically enabled uh, the Dirac pilots on the US uh, resources. And now our jobs are crossing the Atlantic on a daily basis. We also had uh, discussions with the high energy physics community, uh, the worldwide large hadron collider computing grid. Uh, so where I, I gave a presentation there. Uh, to highlight what we are doing and uh, thanks to that um, uh, sites are now supporting the additional sites so we have the Centre de Physique des Particules de Marseille where our jobs are ending, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology is providing us a lot of resource and uh, we are in the process of enabling uh, the Spanish uh, uh, tier 2 site. And uh, again, thanks to, to André, the DIAC site, uh, so we have a mechanism now to tag jobs as being COVID and sites can be tagged as well as being COVID-19 supporting sites, which allow us to direct a submission. So you see here uh, an overview of the last 30 days of direct submissions. So the kind of uh, say magenta, violet color are COVID-related, covid tag COVID jobs. So we enabled that early April, pretty much in the first week of April, and you see now that uh, about almost 50% or more of the jobs at some point are related to COVID research. And uh, this was over the same period. So we had actually more, we have processed more jobs out of about 60,000 in total in a week time, uh, more than a half were COVID related. And this is where those COVID related jobs have been running. So Gridka was the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, Sir Nikkev and Sarah in the Netherlands, the US Open Science Grid, uh, the, the high energy physics uh, site in, um, in Marseille and uh, the, the Polish site. Uh, and now we are also monitoring actually from the end point. So this is uh, probably from the last two weeks, users can tag their submission also. So we see which fraction of the, the current jobs are actually COVID. We have also uh, been doing uh, on our own side uh, some COVID related activities. So we have been doing drug repurposing screening about 2,000 uh, approved drugs against the uh, protease uh, of, the, of the virus. And we were able, using again the HTC resources of PGI and Open Science Grid via DIRAC uh, to process about 2,000 docking runs in about three and a half days, which is a really impressive high throughput uh, if you consider that Haddock is not that fast in terms of computation. And there are also initiatives here mentioning between uh, the BioXL Center of Excellence and MOL SSI, which is the, the equivalent of BioXL in the US, to, to basically collect data about this. So I'm almost done. So where are we going? Uh, so in the future, uh, we speak more and more about, say, cloud resources, the European Open Science Cloud. So we want to have us transparently both. And this is already possible thanks to DIRAC for EGI. I realize I make a lot of publicity for DIRAC, but it's a very good service. So we don't need to worry about provisioning cloud machines. DIRAC does that for you. Um, we are also working in the context of the BioXL Center of Excellence project to move ad hoc to what exascale. So here uh, we are looking at using mainly singularity containers to run on a large scale simulation on HPC resources. And we are working currently also on deploying a clone of a portal dedicated uh, to COVID projects in the Fed cloud. With that, I'm finished. I have to, I mentioned already several projects of the years that have been providing funding uh, to our uh, efforts. I want to, uh, to thank also uh, the entire group in Utrecht who have been supporting everything that we've been doing over the years. 
Uh, in particular, Brian Jimenez and uh, Rodrigo Vargas Honorato are the ones who are actually uh, further developing the portals and operating the portals in the context of EOX Sub and, and Bar Excel. Uh, Panagiotis Kukos and Manon are the two who, has, who have been doing this screen against the uh, COVID protease. And I should also mention some former group members who are instrumental in, in developing our, our web portals, in uh, providing a, a modern registration system. So Mikael, Jörg, Joao, and Rido. Andre, big thanks also for, for all the support in using Dirac for EGI and the EGI and all the people at EGI for the continuous support over the years. Thank you very much for your attention. And I